Today we're going to study the key to contentment and this is a real key lesson. It really is. This is a lesson that we, that there's no way we could have edited this lesson out because this lesson has the potential really and truly the lesson you did this week to uh, bring everything else together that you've learned thus far. If you missed this lesson, if you did not do your homework this week, you need to do your homework this week because it is really a key principle that we're going to look at this week that some of you may have been very familiar with. It's the fear of the Lord. But a lot of times we don't fully understand or comprehend what that means and the difference that it makes in our day-to-day -day lives. And we need to understand that because in the principles of learning what it means to fear the Lord, we'll see that everything else, all of his other commands and everything else, that's where they, the fear of the Lord is what complements them and the fear of the Lord is what empowers those commands. But before we begin looking at that, I'm going to do something that you were not expecting. Do you remember ever going to class when you were in junior high or high school? And your teacher would show up and you would just get there and the class would start and the bell would ring and she would say, get out a sheet of paper and number from one to ten. <laughs> Close your books. Put them under your seats. Today we're going to have a pop quiz. Okay. I like to do this. I don't know why. I like to do this. And so today we're going to have a pop quiz. But listen, don't freak out about this pop quiz, okay? Here's my deal. My big deal about what we've been learning, especially in this second half. The first half, I think you kind of remember as far as the seasons of life and all that. That is so practical and that is something that, you know, we're all able to identify with in one way or another. The second half, though, is where the application comes in. And I am so committed. And I think you've seen that in your homework and I think you've seen it week to week in these lessons each week. I am so committed that you memorize these principles and that you don't go away and forget what you've learned. I want you to be able to recall these things in your mind and I know this, repetition is the key to memorization. That's just a good, pre that's just a good teaching principle and so we're going to do a little repetition this week like we've done the weeks before and as you've done in your homework and I'm going to give you a pop quiz today. You've got a handout in front of you. And I'm going to ask you to fill out the top part of that just one by one. We'll do a little bit of it together. Then I'm going to leave you on your own. Listen, you don't have to get every single word perfect. You, I'm not going to ask you at the end of this to pass it to the person behind you. Get out your red pens and all that kind of stuff. So don't worry about that. This is just, I hope, to kind of get you thinking and get you to seeing, you know, where do I need to maybe bone up on some of these principles. So don't worry about word for word. Don't worry about everything being exactly perfect. As long as you get the, the, the main point, the gist of it, that's okay. Okay, and you'll make a passing grade, okay? So let's do this. What have we been studying? The first one on there, we have been studying the principles of blank. What? Contentment. That's exactly right. So there's your first answer. Now that was easy, wasn't it? That was good. Y'all all got that. So we've been studying the principles of contentment. Now A, on that outline, the first thing we saw about these principles of contentment is that we've got to submit to some things. What have we been calling those things? We've got to submit to the what? What have you got there? Think about that. Submit to the... All right, I see some searching eyes. You're looking for me to give you a hint, aren't you? Well, like those nice teachers do. They would give you a hint, wouldn't they? All right. The four... Not four doors. Okay, not four doors. Four truths. That's right. Four truths. Did you put down there then the submit to the four truths about life? Because there are four truths about life that we see. I gave you the scriptures there, Ecclesiastes 3, um, 1 to 11. And in those scriptures we've been seeing that there are four true things that Solomon says we can know about life today and about the seasons of life. And so that's the next four things that are going to be there on your list. And what was the first truth that he said? Truth number one, fill that in and then look up at me when you get finished with it. I'll give it just a second. Truth number one, it's in Ecclesiastes 3, 1. I'm not going to look at you anymore. Y'all are asking me for answers. I've been nice so far, okay? Four truths. I hear some of you saying it. Very good. 
Like I said, you don't have to get it word for word. Do y'all think I'm just being mean and ornery? Okay. Number one is this. There is a season for everything in life. Remember? There's a season for everything in life. We've got to submit to that fact that, Lord, there's a season for everything, the good, the bad, and everything in between. That All those seasons, there's a season for summer, fall, winter, spring, and autumn. There's a season for everything in life. Now, what was the second truth? Think about that. There's a season. What else did you learn about the seasons? Think about that. What was the next truth about life? And it dealt with those seasons, too. Think about that verse. God has made everything. What does that mean? Think about that. Well, the second truth is this. God has made every season with purpose. He's made all things beautiful in His time would have been a good answer. He's made all things appropriate in its time. God has made every season we saw, it has purpose in it. Sometimes we don't think that, do we? Sometimes we think this just does not make sense. Why do I have to endure this? Why do I have to go through this? Well, God says he's made a season for everything and that all those things have their place, have their time, and they are beautiful. They're appropriate for you. Now, the third thing is one of those like deep thoughts, and it's the third truth. What else has God done? What else has God done? Okay, fill that in, number three. Think about that. And that's Ecclesiastes 3.11, just to give you a little hint is where this one was. You ready for a hint? God has made us long for something. What? Some of you are getting it. Mm -hmm. Some of you are saying it. God has made us long. And the answer is this, for eternal significance in our lives. We want to know that our lives have eternal purpose, that what we're going through really has a reason. We want to know why God, don't we? We want to know. That's our big question, why God? We long for eternal significance. We long for life to make sense. We long to know that whatever I'm going through has an eternal meaning and eternal significance about it, don't we? We're always asking why. God put that there, and we're only going to find that eternal significance, those, that, that, that knowledge that, that life is worthwhile, that life is meaningful when we find it in God. Now, there's a fourth truth, and it's sort of what we've been calling the rub. God's made us long for eternal significance, but the last truth is what? You write that in. You fill that in. Okay? Use your own words. Fill it on in. We're sort of doing this as a group, aren't we? That's okay. That's okay. As long as you're thinking, as long as I'm making you process, I'm happy, okay? I don't need for you to have every single answer correct. That's not what we're going for exactly right now. But I do want you to keep these things in mind. And I do hope you're placing them to your memory. Well, what's the rub? What's the third truth or the fourth truth there? Well, he's made us long for eternal significance, but... We cannot know the eternal significance of our lives this side of eternity. I can't have all my answers an a answered. I can't have all my questions answered, rather. I can't have all the I's dotted and all the T's crossed. There are going to be things in my life that I will never, ever, ever understand this side of glory. I may see in part, but I won't see completely until I see him face to face. And then I will know, even as I am known, the Bible says. We cannot know. And so what that means is, I'm going to have to trust God, aren't I? I'm going to have to walk by faith and not by sight. These are four truths that I have to finally come to, and I just get on my knees and I say, Lord, I submit to this. And when I get there, then I'm ready to begin to do some things. And that's where we come to the next part of our study and what we've been studying the past few weeks. We've said you've got to practice some things. And on your outline, on B, what are the things that I've told you that you have to practice? We've called them something. I've said I call up in my mind this picture, and what is it? When I begin to, all right, so I've got to practice the what? That's it, the three doors to contentment. The three doors to contentment. I've got to practice the three doors of contentment. Now, you should all have these next ones down because you've really been focused in on these the last few weeks. 
What is that first door of contentment? Door number one. Rejoice. Rejoice in every season, you think? Well, certainly, in every season we're to rejoice. And then secondly, what are we to do? What's the second door of contentment? To do good. These are simple, aren't they? Rejoice, do good. And the third door is what? See good or enjoy good. Whichever one, you, whichever one seems to uh, click for you. Both of them are correct. Either see good or enjoy good. And then this week you learned that there is a key. You have to use the key. And what is the key? Fear the Lord. Fear God, he says. Fear God. Use the key. Well, how did you do on your pop quiz? I hope you did. I hope you at least got the second ones out there. Are y'all getting those three doors? Are you? I think you are. I can pick out those other ones. There, there are lots of words there, aren't they? But what I hope you've gotten is the main concept is, listen, God's in control of all the seasons, and he's got a purpose in it and a plan in it. And when I come to him, I've just got to say, okay, God, you're God. I'm not. I'm going to trust you that you're in control. These are your seasons for my life. There's purpose in them. You don't have to know all the exact words out of here is what I'm saying, but that you do come to a point where you say, Lord, you're, you're Lord. You're Lord. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to do good and I'm going to see good and enjoy good in this life because I fear you. I'm going to pick up the key and I'm going to turn the lock and I'm going to unlock the doors to contentment. I came up here yesterday to this church because my son JJ, my youngest, takes guitar lessons here. And we drove up and we were early for his lesson. And he got out of the car, and usually when he gets out of the car and he gets in those, that first set of doors out there, I drive off, you know. But yesterday, uh, I, just, I didn't drive off. I, I, I just sat there, and I, I kind of watched him go on in. And when, I was so glad I did, because when he got to the second set of doors that actually lead up to where his lessons are, he couldn't get in. All the doors were locked. And so he went over to a larger set of doors, and I could see him in there just, you know, fruitlessly trying to unlock each one, trying to get into each one of these doors, and he couldn't do it. And he thought I'd already gone, because that's what I normally do. You know, I usually just go on. He's a big boy, and, and he knows his way around here real well. He stood there for the longest time after he shook all those doors, and he tried to see, you know, if he could get in. And you know what? I could almost, I could almost see the wheels turning in his mind. What was he thinking? How am I going to get in there? How am I going to get up to my classroom? And my son knows the way around here. And there's a lot of different ways you can get around here, but this place is a maze, isn't it? It is a maze. There's no sometimes easy way to get to some places in this church. And I dropped him off at the door that makes the most direct route to where he can get to his guitar lesson. I could see him thinking almost, how am I going to get there? What door should I try next? Because there are doors on the outside of this building. There are doors kind of on an interior level. And I was thinking, how is he going to do? How is he going to get to that room? But I didn't let him suffer for very long because you know what I knew? On my keychain there, I had a key that would unlock one of those doors. And so I, t I stopped my car, turned it off, and I went in, and I held up the key, and boy, he just smiled. Oh, he was glad because he was thinking about all the long routes he was going to have to take to get to that room, you know, because you can walk miles around this church, can't you? I had a key. I simply unlocked the door. He went straight up to his class, and, and he was fine. And you know what? Don't we spend a lot of time in our lives, aimlessly trying to get to contentment by just searching and going this way and that way and this way and that way on our own, on our own power, on our own strength, on our own plans. Don't we do that a lot? We're trying to get to satisfaction, to a place where we find meaning and purpose and contentment in life. There's a direct route. There's a direct route and God's giving each one of us a key that will allow us to enter in to the satisfaction, to the joy, to the contentment that he has for us. And that key is fear of the Lord. We've got to fear Him. When I fear Him, it's going to cause me to be able to unlock each one of these doors that we've looked at, looked at the past few weeks to rejoice, to do good, and to see good. Scripture teaches you and me that we are to fear the Lord. And in Ecclesiastes specifically, it says this, we're to fear the Lord. Why? Well, because His works and His ways are eternal and they are perfect. He wants us to fear Him because he knows this, and so should we. Though his ways and his works are eternal, and they are truly perfect. They're immutable. There's no better way. And yet, don't we try a lot of other ways? Don't we try and spin around and do all kinds of things in our own energy and our own strength? But he has a good way, a perfect way, an eternal way, and his way is perfect. His way is good. Ecclesiastes 3.14 says this, I know everything. There's that word again. If you notice that the word everything is used a lot in Ecclesiastes, everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing, absolutely nothing to add to it, and there 
is nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. He is trying to show you and me, I have a way and I have a plan. And my way is the best way. My way is the perfect way. My way is the way that will lay up treasures in eternity. My way is all about eternal things. It's not about the temporal. It's about the eternal. And if you'll just come to me and find my plan and my way, listen, I'll let you enjoy it. You can have a life of abundance. You can have a life that is full. You can have a life that is completely satisfying because that's exactly what Christ died to give you. And yet sometimes we just... We're just trying out. We're just out there doing the best we can in our own strength, in our own way, trying to take care of everything ourselves, trying to shake those doors and get where we want to do in our own strength, in our own power. But God has so worked that men should fear Him so that we would know the way is through Him. And He is the one, if we'll fear Him, He will lead us to His perfect way. Well, we're to fear the Lord also because life will be well for those who fear Him. Solomon said, if you want a good life, if you want life to go, go well for you, then fear the Lord. Life will be well for those who fear Him, but life will not be well for those who do not fear Him. It is a frustrating, futile life for those who do not fear the Lord. It is emptiness. You have faced that even as a Christian, but primarily those in the world, those who are not believers, I don't care how much money they've got, I don't care how many houses they own, I don't care how much success and how many plaques and how many awards, listen, there's meaningless in that. And in their hearts, they know that. There's a meaningless there. Life will be well. Life will be full for you and for me if we will fear the Lord. Ecclesiastes 8, 12, and 13 says, Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know it will be well for those who fear the Lord and who fear Him open, openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days because he does not fear the Lord. Look up there in the middle of that verse where it says, It will be well for those who fear God and who fear Him how? openly, okay, not just in my head. Oh, Lord, yeah, you know, you know I respect you and I revere you. You know he's saying those who do it openly. That means I live the life. I walk the talk, okay? And that is what he's saying. It'll be well for those who practice their faith. We are also to fear the Lord, number three, is this, because it is the final conclusion, Solomon says. It is the primary truth that applies to every single person. It is the final conclusion. He could have said, it, this is the bottom line of everything. The bottom line is simply this. You are to fear the Lord and you are to keep His commandments. The conclusion, he says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, as he finishes this book off, Solomon writes, the conclusion when all has been heard is this. Fear God, keep His commandments, because this applies to every single person. And the last thing I've got on there, well, D on there, is this, that we're to fear the Lord because this. It is linked to obeying God and to keeping His commandments. And y'all, I want you to put a star by that on your outline today. I want you to put a star by that because, listen, this is exactly what we're going to talk about today. The link between the fear of the Lord and obeying the Lord. They are inextricably linked when we're talking about the Christian faith and the Christian walk. There are people, I will tell you, and you can look in, I think it was 2 Kings 17, I was studying yesterday for a little while. 2 Kings 17 talks about the children of Israel when they had been through all the kings and all this. They had, uh, they, this is, of course, after David's reign and several hundred years even following David, there were all these kings, and we began to see even after Solomon came that the kingdom split into two, that it split into the northern and the southern kingdom of uh, the Israelites. And both of those kingdoms eventually began to get involved in idolatry. They began to worship other gods. They began to practice the pagan rituals and practices. They even made their children, some of them, walk through fire. Do you understand? To go through the fire. They gave their children to the fires of Molech, a god, a pagan god, things like that. They began to co-mingle their religion and their God with the gods of all the nations around them. And in 2 Kings 17, it says this, that they feared God, but they also worshipped other gods. Well, how can you do that? I want you to know that there is a fear of the Lord that is only intellectual. It is only, whew, I know you're real, and I know one day there's an impending judgment. Barna Institute just came out with a study just last week. It was in the paper. And the Barna Institute says most people, primarily the majority of people in America, do believe that there's a coming judgment, that there's a heaven, there's a hell, and that there will be a coming judgment. Most people know that. And they have a sort of an intellectual fear of the Lord and a knowledge that there's a coming judgment one day. But listen, what you and I are to have and what God wants us to have is not just this intellectual fear of Him. 
It is not enough. What he wants us to have is the fear of the Lord that results in a changed life, in a life that obeys him, in a life that keeps his commandments. And so we see here that the fear of the Lord is linked to obeying God and keeping his commandments. There are some who will say, oh, yes, I fear the Lord. But listen. Most people do know there's God. They know there's a coming judgment. They do have a reverence for God. What we're talking about is the reverence that also follows through with obedience. It's linked to obeying God and keeping His commandments. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he finishes off that verse, and he says, Fear God and keep His commandments. So put a star by that because that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. We're to fear the Lord lastly then because God will bring every act into judgment. And that is how he closes this book. Solomon says, For God will bring every act to judgment, everything, there it is again, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or whether it is evil. We should fear the Lord. We should obey him because one day we're going to be judged. That should motivate us to walk in obedience and in the fear of the Lord. Well, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Let's just look at it just a little bit more. First of all, it involves both attitude and action. This type of the fear of the Lord that the Lord wants us to have for Him involves both attitude and action. And the first thing we're going to look at is the attitude. And that attitude is just simply a reverence to God because of His power and His position. We're to have an attitude of reverence, of respect, of godly fear for a God who is much greater and much higher than we are, for a God who is the Creator. He has power and He has a position. He's above all gods. And He should be reverenced. But the second thing we see about the fear of the Lord is that it's to be an action. It's to be an action that results in, listen, a desire to please Him. A desire to please Him. And this is what makes our fear as a Christian different from the fear that most other people have of the Lord. We have a fear that goes beyond just a reverence and we have a desire. Lord, I reverence you, and I want you to be pleased with me. I want you to be pleased with my life. I want to live a way that would, that would bring you pleasure. It results in action that desires to please him and a choice. And I would circle choice because that's where the rubber meets the road. It's a choice, a choice to obey him. It's an attitude of reverence and respect. But, y'all, that's only halfway. That is only halfway, and halfway won't get you there. Halfway won't get you to meaning in life. Halfway won't get you to satisfaction. Halfway won't get you to joy. Halfway won't bring you into God's presence for all time and all eternity. Okay? Only a full-hearted fear of the Lord that results in the action of desiring to please Him and then making a choice to obey Him will bring us the satisfaction and the meaning that we're longing for in life. Well, B says there that, Therefore, if I say I fear the Lord, then... The result will be that I respect and obey the Lord. If I say as a Christian, Lord, I fear you, or I tell other people that I'm a God-fearing person, or I, I believe that about myself in my heart, it's more than just words. It's more than just intellect. It will result not just in a respect, but it will result in true obedience. You saw some people this week in your homework that you looked at, and you looked at some, uh, some that we'll look at today also, but there was one that you didn't look at, and I want you to look, first of all, at a man named Noah. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis, because Noah is one of the first of three examples that we're going to look at this morning of people who had this kind of fear for God that went beyond a reverence and a respect and an attitude, but moved into holy living and holy action and into obedience to God. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. We're going to look at that first. Genesis 6, 5 to 9. The Bible says this, that the Lord saw the wickedness of man, and he saw that it was so great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And this is a sad verse. And the Lord was sorry that he'd even made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, from man to animals, creeping things to birds in the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. And then here's a great word in the Bible, but, but. Isn't this good? Listen, this is, this is good here. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. But for Noah... God would have just started completely over. I don't know what he would have done. He would have blotted every man out but Noah, found favor. And he tells about Noah there that Noah was a man who lived righteously and blamelessly. He was a lot like a man that we looked at a few weeks ago, Job. 
He was a lot like him. He was one man on earth that God could look at and he would smile. And he would say, this man pleases me by the way he lives. Drop down to verse 13. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them within the earth. Now look at verse 12. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had been corrupted in their way upon the earth. Then drop down to verse 15 again. And he tells Noah, this is how you shall make it. He tells him to make an ark in verse 14 of gopher wood. And he tells him all the details, how to make it, how to put the windows in it, what to load onto that ark, what to take. And it's just uh, details after detail after detail. And then in verse 18, he says, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons and your wives with you. We see here that Noah is going to obey every single one of these details. Now drop down to verse, 30, verse 22, I'm sorry. And it says, Thus Noah did according to, and I would circle the word all. Noah did according to all God had commanded him. So he did. Did Noah fear the Lord? How did he prove it? He did everything that God required him to do. God does care about the details, y'all. He sweats the details. He doesn't want us to live burdened down with them, but he wants us to take into, him into consideration in every decision that we make. And he laid these details out, and Noah said, I will faithfully do it because I fear you. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, and you'll see what Hebrews says about this man, Noah. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence. There's the word fear. Your Bible may say holy fear. It may say godly fear. It may say reverence, whatever. But it's the word for the fear of the Lord. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about the things that he had not yet seen. Listen. It had never rained before. The dew used to come up on the ground. It used to, that used to water and replenish the earth. He'd never seen rain before. So by faith, what did he do? In reverence, he prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. What I want you to see is this. Noah was a man who feared the Lord. He lived by faith. He just did what God asked him to do by faith even when he couldn't see that it made any sense at all. He just went about living his life the way God asked him to live. He was an obedient man. Abraham was another man you looked at this week and you looked at him in Genesis chapter 22. And you see in Genesis chapter 22 that God makes a request of him that I can't even imagine God coming to me and asking me for. And yet we see Abraham's response is just the next morning he gets up and what does he do? He begins to prepare to obey the Lord. We see in Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 to 3, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Drop down to verse 5. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder, and we will do what? We will worship. He is committed to worshiping the Lord. He fears the Lord. And he is committed to taking this son Isaac, his only son whom he loves, the heir of the promise, the one that God promised would begin a, a line, a lineage that would bring Abraham as many sons as the sand on the seashore. We see him take him up to that mount, and you know the story probably very well. Well, he takes him on the mount. He prepares the place for the sacrifice. And as he begins to lift up his, his knife to take his son's life, God calls to him and he says, Abraham, Abraham. And he, he tells him, no, you don't have to do this thing. But why did God do that to him? Why? And it's down there in verses 15 to 18. Look at verses 15 to 18. And Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. And then in verse 15 it says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. And he said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and you've not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have what? Obeyed me. This was a test. It was a test. And God said to him earlier in this chapter, he said, now I know that you fear me. Listen, we prove to God. He knows. But he wants us to see. He wants to put us to the test. And he wants us to see. He puts us in these tests that we will see. It goes beyond 
even things that make sense to me, that I would step out by faith and do something that seemed to be absolutely opposite of everything that God would have me do. And yet I go ahead and I do it because I fear Him. I walk in obedience to Him. Abraham and his example then of the fear of the Lord. You also look this week at the Hebrew midwives. They're in Exodus. The uh, Hebrew people had begun to multiply there in Egypt. The Egyptians became very nervous because they were outnumbered by these Hebrews. And the, the Pharaoh made a command. And he went and he got the Hebrew midwives and he told them to do something. What was it he told them to do? He said, listen, when you go to these women who are about to give birth, if you see that it's a male, once you see that this child is a male, what are you to do? You're to put that child to death. I began to think about something this week that is before our nation right now. It's the issue of partial birth abortion. Y'all, it's been around a long, long time. And I pray that it will be ending soon. It looks like that's the way our country is moving. I'm grateful for that. But listen, these Hebrew midwives were required by Pharaoh to practice partial birth abortion. They were, as soon as they were to recognize that the, this child was male, they were, in one way or another, to kill this child. He was telling them to commit murder, to commit this horrible, horrible practice. What did they do? They did civil disobedience. They said, yes, sir, but they turned right around, and what did they do? They said to God, we fear you more. Yes, sir, you, we will not do this. We know this goes completely against what God would have us do. And so they would not do it, and God blessed their lives incredibly because they feared the Lord instead of fearing Pharaoh. They feared the Lord instead of fearing the disgusting, terrible practices of the, of the Pharaoh that day, and God blessed their lives. So we see three who feared the Lord, and they feared the Lord more that went beyond just what they thought and had the reverential respect they would have for God. It lived out in actions of obedience. And their examples reveal that here's what else is involved in the fear of the Lord. We see faith. Abraham by faith, Noah by faith, they, he built an ark. Abraham by faith took his son up to Mount Moriah. It involves submission, saying, okay, God, I submit to you. I don't understand this. Obedience also and the fear of the Lord involves sacrifice, and it involves courage. But listen, it will result in blessing. It will result in blessing when we fear the Lord. These are all characteristics of those who fear the Lord. Well, I want to ask you a question. If you decide to live life your way and to try to open those doors to joy and to abundance and to contentment and to meaning and to satisfaction and to purpose and all these kinds, if you keep trying to do that on your own, when you become discontent, when you become dissatisfied, when you begin to ebb low and nothing's going right and you feel like, you know, I'm just going to take things into my own hands and live life the way I want to live it because I just can't do this anymore. What are the dangers of doing that? What are really the dangers of not fearing the Lord, of not choosing to pick up the key and obey Him because you fear Him? Well, I began to think this week, and this comes back to my mind frequently, and I really don't like this memory, but I'm going to share this with you because this is, the, for me, the best illustration of the dangers of discontentment, the dangers of dissatisfaction. Many years ago, I had a friend, and I loved her dearly, and I still do. And I'll see her one day, I know, again. She was my age. She had children my age. She had three girls, and I had three boys. We sort of grew up together for a few years together, and we loved each other, and we prayed with each other. Her husband was a minister, and my husband was a minister, and we had a lot in common. We both had children about the same age, and we both had husbands who were in ministry. She and I both were uh, very, very much alike, except we were very opposite in our personality. She was very extroverted, very outgoing. She was one of those kind of moms who would get in the floor and just roughhouse with her, with her kids. You know, she was one of those hands-on kind of moms. I have to tell you, I'm not really that way. I like to bake cookies, and I like to love on them, and I like to do some things. You know what I'm talking about, but she was just one of those, let's put them all in the wagon. Let's go pull them around the block, Laurie. Come on, let's go do this. She was always wanting to go, 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 do, 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 and that's not really my thing too much. But I just loved her enthusiasm, and I loved the way she loved her children. I loved the model that she was, and I admired her. We uh, did not enjoy very many years together because we were separated. We came to Houston, Bill and I did, of course, but this friend of mine and I stayed in contact through the years and um, became less and less frequent, though, as the years went by. Several years ago, I um, was in the area where she lived, 
and I was going to be there for a few days, and I was going to be there on a Sunday when I knew she would be in church, and I could go and surprise her. And so I made a decision to go to that church on a Sunday where her husband was a minister and just show up and surprise her. You know, just I hadn't seen her in quite some time, and I really was looking forward to seeing her again. When I got there to the church, I ran into her husband first, and he was very surprised to see me. And uh, he hugged my neck, and I hugged his, and I, he said, you know, what are you doing here? And I told him I was, I was there to surprise his wife, that I hadn't seen her, and I was looking forward to her, and I was in the area. And he got a very strained look on his face. And I could tell something was wrong. Something was terribly, terribly wrong. And I had heard her mother was not doing well, that her mother was... Um, that her mother had really, her mother had died. Her mother had had a long, long illness, and I thought maybe there were some things that had happened, and I just thought maybe some repercussions because of her mother's death. But then he began to tell me that it was even far worse than I thought it was. We didn't have very long to talk, but he did tell me this. He said, I don't know, Laurie, if you will even recognize her. She will be here tonight, but I doubt you'll recognize her. She doesn't even look the same as you would remember but I hope you'll be able to talk to her. I hope you'll be able to visit with her. I hope she'll open up to you. He didn't. He kind of left me with question marks. I didn't know exactly what to expect. But not long after that, I saw her. She came into the church. She came in through the back doors, and she saw me a distance away. And do you know what she didn't do? She didn't light up and smile. She didn't go, wow, like I wanted her to, you know, like I did when I saw her. I recognized her. But I have to admit, she was very, very different than the person I had just seen you know, the years before. She had lost an incredible amount of weight. She was skin and bones. She was emaciated. She looked weak and frail, this strong kind of a mom that she used to be. She was not at all that, and she looked very, very unhappy. She was not extroverted anymore. She was bitter. She was hurting, and I thought it was the bitterness at first of losing her mother and the, the grief that she was going through. I went up to her, and she didn't say, Laurie, I'm glad to see you. She basically said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I really believe that she thought her husband had called me, you know, to come. I, I think that she thought the motives, the whole thing was a setup. I visited for, with her for a while, and I just told her, you know, I'm here, I'm here to see you. I just was here in town, and we visited, and I said, you know, I, I hope we can spend some time together tomorrow, whatever. Do you think we could get together? And she was very noncommittal. She did not even sit with me that night in church. She went and she sat toward the back of the church all by herself, and before the service was over with, she left. I didn't get to say goodbye to her. I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. So I picked up the phone the next day and I called her and I invited myself over to her house. And I said, I want to see you. I want to talk to you. Something's wrong and I want to talk to you. And she really didn't want to talk, but she knew I wasn't going to go away. And so I did. I got in my car and I went to her house and we sat down and she just laid it all out for me. She didn't hold anything back. What had happened was when they had come to this particular church, her husband was pastor and she really and truly felt very, very, um, she didn't like the living in the glass house at all. She felt very much that she could never meet the expectations of what it meant to be a pastor's wife. She was very insecure about all of that. At the time when they moved there also, her mother was going through her second or third bout, I believe, of a terrible, terrible disease. And my friend was having to go back and forth every single week to care for her mother for a few days every week and then come back to the area where they lived so that she could take care of things around the house and the children and all that. Her children were there while we talked, and do you know what? All she did was yell at them. I'd never seen this. She would just go, get out of here. Go get your stuff ready, just things like that. I'd never heard. I'd never seen that side of her before. She was a completely, totally different person. She told me that in the process of going back and forth and back and forth all those months that her mother was dying, and she finally did die, had taken such a physical toll on her that she had begun to do something that she didn't even hold back from it. She said, I began to take my mother's pain medication because I was, all the driving had wrecked my back, all the lifting my mother, all that kind of stuff. I thought it would be fine, and she, she had become addicted to those prescription drugs. And after her mother's death, she had continued to take them and refill those prescriptions until something terrible happened. One day, as she was going to pick up one of those prescriptions at a pharmacy, she was arrested, the pastor's wife. When she was arrested, they told her that if she would go to treatment and if she would go to counseling, that it would not go on her record, and so she agreed to do that. But there were other problems. 
it was deeper than that. It was deeper than just the grief. It was deeper than just the physical pain that she was experiencing. It was deeper than just the addiction that she had become involved in. She was trying to numb all the pain of her mother's death, but she was also trying to numb the pain of her reality. She didn't like where she was. She didn't like the status in her life that she was a pastor's wife. She didn't like it anymore. She didn't like it at all. The other mitigating factor that happened was she had become involved with another woman who had shown up to be her savior. When my friend would go to Houston, this woman would come and take my friend's children, would take care, and she was just doing everything she could to kind of help my friend prop her up, bringing her food, bringing her meals. She was everything. And she told me, my friend said, this woman is everything to me. She is everything to me. When somebody tells me that, do you know what I see? Red flags. I began to talk to her. And I told my friend this. I said, this relationship doesn't sound healthy to me. And she became very defensive, very defensive. Our conversation didn't end well. She said, I, I prayed for her, and I, I told her that, you know, I'd love to stay in better contact with her and try to help her get all through it. She, had, she said, I don't know. I don't even care anymore. I don't care if the marriage works out. I don't care anymore about anything. I talked to her about who she used to be. You know, I talked to her about the person that I used to know who loved God's Word, who taught God's Word, who prayed with me, who loved her children. I talked to her about the woman who, that used to love her husband. They had a great marriage. She said, I don't know where she went, basically. Life had happened to her. The seasons had come. And what happened was what happens to many of us, things had piled on. It wasn't one thing. It was another thing and another thing and another thing. And then Satan had sent somebody along, this woman, who looked like an angel of light, to minister to her, and she fell headlong into a trap that absolutely tore their marriage apart. I continued to follow up. The last conversation I had, I called, and she would not speak to me. She said, tell her I don't want to talk to her. I never expected my friend to say those words to me. I never expected to see my friend in the, in the state that she was in. But what happened was she became so discontent and seasons came, and circumstances came, and problems came, and they piled on and on and on until finally she just said, I've had it. I can't do this anymore. I don't even want to do this anymore. After I called her that time and she wouldn't speak, I followed up one more time, and I found out that she had left her family. She had not even given them a phone number to contact her. She left her husband and her children. The other woman left her husband and her children, and they moved in together, and they began a life together. Several years ago, I got a telephone call from someone who knew this friend of mine. And they told me, Laurie, I'm looking at your friend's obituary in the paper. She was my age. She was too young to die. She died of a freak accident, just a freak accident. I believe, personally, and this may sound harsh, but the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 that there is a sin unto death that there's a point where some of us may come when God says, that's enough. You've hurt my kingdom. You've hurt my son. You've grieved me. You've hurt too many people. And that's it. I'm going to take you home. And I truly believe I wouldn't even share this with you because it's personal to me. wouldn't even share this with you except for the fact that I believe if she were here today, she would tell you it's dangerous to get discontent. It's dangerous, dangerous, dangerous to begin to say, Lord, I know what to do, but I'm tired of doing it. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, Lord, I respect you. I know you're God, but I'm living life on my terms because it's just too hard. There are too many other things that are piling on me right now. How can you expect me? How can you expect me to rejoice and do good and see good? How can you expect me to walk in obedience? Look what you've done to my life. When we get to that point, listen, what the Lord showed me through that was this, for me personally, were those little words there, but for the grace of God, go I. I shudder when I think about that. Because if I, if you knew her like I knew her all those years ago, we were so much alike. We loved our husbands. We loved our families. We loved God's word. We loved our husbands that they were ministers. We supported them, you know. We, we loved all that. And when I saw how far she could go, what I saw was I had the propensity, I, I, could, I could do the very same thing if I just made one decision about a little thing and then followed it up with another little decision and then another little decision, you fall headlong in this discontented state into Satan's trap. 
It is very, very important that you pick up the key, ladies, that you say, Lord, I don't really like this, the way things are right now. I don't know what you're doing. I have lots of questions, God. I'm not liking this a bit. But by faith, I'm going to pick up this key, and I'm going to fear you. And I'm not just going to say, I fear you in my mind, but I'm going to obey you, and I'm going to unlock some doors. I'm going to choose to make rejoicing my way of life. I'm going to do good here in this season. I'm going to see even good in this season. If we don't, listen, we can be taken to very desperate, desperate places, and we may even be taken to a place we would never ever dream would be possible for our lives. Contentment in every season of life is possible, but it's up to you. Contentment is a choice. It's your choice, and it's my choice. And this is what I've learned about choosing contentment. I cannot unlock the doors to contentment by waiting until I feel like rejoicing. And I can't unlock the doors to contentment by waiting for my season or my circumstances to improve before I do good. I cannot even unlock the doors to contentment by waiting until I can see the value of all I'm doing. But, and this is the really good news, in every single season of life, I can unlock the doors to contentment. I can experience contentment in every season when I choose to rejoice, to praise God in good seasons and in difficult seasons. When I choose to do good, when my circumstances are wonderful and when my circumstances are not so wonderful. And when I choose to see good, why? Because I fear God. I'm going to close with this. Are you tired of half-hearted Christian living? Are you tired, are you weary of dissatisfaction, of grumbling? Aren't you tired of it? Are you tired of just struggling with God like Jacob did that night, just wrestling with God? Are you just tired of that? Well, what you better do is you better move into obedience because that's the only way you're going to experience the fullness, the abounding satisfaction, the joy, the meaning, the purpose in life. And if you don't, the possibilities are endless what can happen to you. I would have never thought that these children of my friend would grow up without a mother. I would have never imagined that this man would have to leave ministry. I would never imagine that the turmoil that it would have caused in the church and the different things that would have happened. You and I have no idea. Listen, it's not just about us either. It's about those people around us. Our consequences, the repercussions of our decisions to not follow God, to not fear Him, they spill over into the lives of innocent people. I would encourage you in every season to pick up the key, to fear the Lord. Ultimately, though, y'all, it is your choice. It is your choice. God cannot make me do it if I will not. It is my choice to fear the Lord. Will you choose contentment by rejoicing, doing good, seeing good, because you fear the Lord, you reverence Him, and it's not just an attitude, but it's an action that you live it out, that you obey Him. Will you choose contentment? It's your choice. Let's pray. Well, Lord, my heart hurts. But, Father, I believe that I've given these what you've told me to. And, Father, I don't want to sound like a messenger of doom. But, Father, it's all through your word. Lord, our decisions are important. And, Lord, you want us to choose you and to live life your way. And Father, as a result of that, we can experience abundance. And you give us hope. And Father, even when we can't see why all the time, by faith, Lord, when we obey you, we can know that there's purpose in it, that there's eternal value in our lives. Even in the difficult days of our lives, oh God, I pray that I would. Because Lord, I'm not beyond it. I'm not beyond, Father falling away and falling into sin and hurting the people that I love the most. And Father, neither are any of these who are hearing my voice right now. Lord, let us see. 
our awesome responsibility to choose to fear you. And as we choose to fear you, Lord, I pray you would show us that we can experience contentment and satisfaction. And we thank you, Father, for the way you provide that for us. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you have given us a life that has a future and a hope. We thank you for the promise, O oh God, of your word, for the power of it. We ask that you transform us through it. Lord, thank you so much for your word. It's powerful. May we heed it today and live it out in the days ahead. In your name I pray. Amen.